people say, well, there are dangers here. But we're going to skip through this little piece here uh, a little bit, but go ahead. Uh, they call it spleen deficiency. It doesn't. It's just the opposite. How did that research, how did that myth get going? Well, in the 1930s, the Chinese uh, were having food famine and people who couldn't afford anything except a little vegetables and rice became weak and you know died from starvation. Whereas the wealthy people, they were eating meat and doing different things. And so it said, well, it's, it's because you were a vegan. No, it isn't because you're vegan. It's because you didn't have any food and you were starving. Next slide. So with spleen de the deficiency as you, you know, kind of decline, you have blood sugar imbalances, weight problems, obesity, alcoholism, drug abuse, low vitality, chronic fatigue. These are all things that happen. The treatment for this is actually Live food vegan. Next slide. Because small chi is good energy, endurance, ability to grow and learn, good memory, and emotional balance, which is exactly what we're talking about with a live food vegan diet. Next slide. But of course, it depends that you have enough food that you're not starving to death. So people made wrong conclusions. So a live food. Vegan cuisine is a cure for spleen chi deficiency. Next slide. Not a cause. Okay, we call vata balance. Kapha, pitta, and vata are Ayurvedic terms. Pitta is fire, vata is air. Kapha is uh, kind of water and earth. And if you aren't grounding yourself, you can get a vata balance. But here's the cure to that. Next slide. So you need high oil content foods like avocado, nut and seed pate, soaked nuts and seeds. And vata people are actually rebalanced by warm, oily, sweet, salty, watery, soupy cuisine. And then moderate use of spices like asafoetida, cumin, ginger, and garlic. So that's how, you know, that balances it. And you can be a, a hunter, you can be a full vata and be 100% my food. I've had many people be successful that way. Next slide. So it's not that complicated. As Ralph Waldo Emerson said, society's always taken by a surprise by any new example of common sense. And what I'm saying is common sense. You have to be the experiment. You have to explore for yourself and find the right balance. That's what I'm saying. I'll give you an example. Next slide, please. Uh, we looked at uh, protein. Some people, about 30% of the people need a lower protein, about 35 grams, and 70% need a higher protein, about 70 grams. And with age, you actually need more protein. So about close to 15 years ago, I was uh, doing pull-ups and I was stuck at 25. Uh, when I was a football player, I could do seven, but I was stuck at 25. And then I read this data. Well, gee, if you're in your 60s, you actually need to have more protein. So I added one tablespoon of a protein concentrate. I think it was uh, blue-green algae. And I jumped from 25 up to 50 and eventually 100 pull-ups. Just one tablespoon. And that's what we have to do. We have to be the experiment. We get guidelines. Yeah, well, I'm a person to eat much protein or, you know, and I don't, you know, uh, uh, maybe 10, 12% of my diet at this point is protein. It works for me. Other people need to have 20%. Okay, but we have to explore this. And we have to experiment. Okay, so now meat eaters and vegans are low in DHA. 
which is a long chain omega-3. Generally speaking, particularly if you're pregnant, you need to take some sort of supplement of DHA because you need a lot. And post-pregnancy as well to recover. 80% are deficient in magnesium. Now that, again, is vegans and meat eaters. And 75 to 95% of people are deficient in iodine. Now, iodine isn't just for your thyroid. It's for your group. It's for your ovaries. It's for your hypothalamic function. It's for your pineal function. So you need a lot of it, okay? And then about B12. Oh, if you're a vegan, you're gonna be B12 deficient. Well, it turns out that 40% of meat eaters are B12 deficient. Uh, and I learned that at Columbia Medical School. And it was like, oh, okay. Yes, more vegans are B12 deficient. Uh, at 200 nanograms, which is the minimum. And 80% of mediators, 90% of vegans need around 400 to 450 nanograms of, of human active B12. It's got to be human active B12. What's my bottom line is I write in my books, everybody should take a human active B12 supplement because our foods are not containing enough because of poor because uh, of uh, deficient soils. So that's kind of how to understand that. So everybody should be doing that. I suggest everybody needs the iodine and also magnesium. I'm not going to mention any products because that's part of what we're not doing here. Uh, but these are really critical uh, factors. Next slide, please. Carnosine is something that really just meat eaters get, but everybody's deficient. And in 1936, congressional report said 99% of the U.S. population is deficient in minerals. So we need a lot of high mineral foods uh, uh, that are out there. Sheila Jit's one of them. And then vitamin D is a big problem. 85% of Americans are low in vitamin D. Minimum is 30 uh, milligrams per milliliter, but we, we need closer to, to you know, uh, 80. Um, and that, of course, protects you against all kinds of viral infections. Next slide, please. And the vitamin K uh, protects the right blood balance. Women and men need slightly different ones. And uh, the vitamin A is a, an interesting problem because uh, there's not a really good solution because it doesn't convert the beta Carotenes don't convert that well in the vitamin A. Uh, really, some people only get 9% conversion. So what's my answer? It, it, it is to have a, a vitamin A supplement, which can be uh, vegan. Next slide, please. So cuisine versus diet. Cuisine is a style. Vegan live food is the style. And uh, the diet is macronutrient ratio. Next slide. And so let's take a look at that. So we've got to get the right ratio for who we are. We are unique. On chromosome 19, it actually says how much carbohydrate, how much fat, and how much protein you need. It's actually in our genes. It tells us we aren't a bunch of cows. We don't just eat grass and everything's fine. We have to individualize your diet. This lecture isn't going to be about that. That's an important principle. And uh, there's ways, if you go to my website, drcousins.com, they will kind of take you to treealife.mn.co. And I have a chart that people can fill out and kind of get a rough idea. Fast, slow, oxidizer type things. Next slide. So 2013. The genome-wide meta-analysis, association of a locus and a chromosome 19, that's what I'm talking about, carbohydrate, fat, and FTO locus with protein intake. So it tells you how much you need. And we are unique individuals. So we have to understand we are unique. There is no one diet for everybody. Very important principle. Next slide. That's where the success lies. Now, on top of that, 
at different ages, we need different inputs. As I explained, and I, you know, at 65, it's like, wait, I need, I need a little bit more protein. And I went from 25 to 100 pull-ups. Okay, one tablespoon. So as we started as kapha, watery, blubbery, lots of earaches, particularly if you have dairy, except mother's milk. And then once you have puberty, we call pitta, that fiery quality. Uh, and then finally vata. Now people are moving into vata at earlier and earlier ages. And having a good vata balancing diet, sweet, salty, oily, uh, kind of uh, watery foods, rubbing oil on your skin, things like that are, are balance the vata. So you can really optimize your vata energy. Mm -hmm.